Welcome to Saturdays at 7, Christian Scholars Review's conversation series with thought leaders about the academic vocation and the relationship that vocation shares with the church. My name is Todd Rehm. I have the privilege of serving as the publisher for Christian Scholars Review and as the host for Saturdays at 7. I also have the privilege of serving on the faculty and the administration at Indiana Wesleyan University. Our guest is Mark A. Null, the Francis A. McEnany Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Notre Dame. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Todd, and thanks to Christian Scholars Review for using this forum for helping out Christian scholars of all kinds. At what point in time did you know you were called to the Christian academic vocation? That's actually an interesting question because I'm not sure that the category Christian academic profession entered my thinking, but I was more and more um, convinced that I should pursue some line of work that involved reading and words and eventually teaching and do so with regard to historical topics. At the same time, as my later undergraduate years and early graduate years was coming to greater clarity about my own Christian faith, own uh, Christian convictions, and the two kind of grew up together. And I was pleased that, let's see, it would have been 1975 to realize that you could actually be paid to teach students and keep reading books and try to write books about subjects I was interested in and to do so with Christian purposes as well. So I would say that a vocation, and I, I use that word deliberately a, a vocation as a historian who was a Christian developed gradually, but early on, by the late uh, 70s, I think I, I knew that that's where I wanted to head. To whom would you give credit for that understanding and its development? Well, my parents were not academics, but they encouraged, certain, my mother was a reader, uh, they, they certainly encouraged good, good work in, in school. I grew up at Calvary Baptist Church in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where, again, not particularly academic, but very conservative, evangelical, but good people. So Don Anderson, Dick Peters, Evelyn Svee, as she was then, Evelyn Lightgard, as she became. Uh, Bob Ask, a, a high school history teacher and a football, one of my football coaches, were all encouraging of the young people, not necessarily to do academic things, but to do whatever it, it, it took. And then certainly as an undergraduate at Wheaton College, I enjoyed the, the studies per se, and I think began to catch a, a little bit of the vision of teaching life, academic life could be from, from really inspiring teachers, Clyde Kilby, Bob Warburton, their English professors, I was an English major, Arthur Holmes, a wonderful year-long course in the history of philosophy that convinced me I wasn't a philosopher, but I knew I was interested in, in the context in which uh, philosophers uh, did, did their work. And then as, as that academic interest was growing, as I mentioned, um, I was coming also to an understanding of my need for Christian foundation and my uh, personal sense of being a uh, sinner who stood before others and God only by grace. And so looking back on the Religious experience I had, I, I sometimes am too critical, I think, but it was from reading books uh, about the Protestant Reformation, mostly. Roland Bayton on Martin Luther, A.G. Dickens on the English Reformation, that I heard a, a clarifying Christian message that touched me existentially and also proved to be really interesting intellectually. And then at the same time, or just a little bit later, I, I was reading Perry Miller on the American Puritans, Edmund, Por Edmund Morgan on the Puritans, the American Revolutionary Period, and these terrific historians and very stimulating authors certainly uh, provided an impetus to go further to see if I could try out to do something along the, along the same line. So influences of different kinds, uh, Soon after I got to uh, graduate school, it started out in, in literature, but then uh, eventually at, in the history of Christianity, there were soon uh, personal encouragers and personal examples that, that I'll probably mention as, as we go along this morning. If I may, can you tell me a little bit more about the transition you made from literature to history? Yes. 
when I was an English major at Wheaton, it was still fairly traditional in impro- approaching literary studies by putting authors in the context of their times and, and doing not detailed history work, but historical situating. At the time I got to the University of Iowa in the comparative literature department, kind of the new literary criticism was in vogue, where with many good results, the, the encouragement was to, to look at the text and focus on the way in which the, the language was being used and what was being communicated by the text itself with the author kind of pushed to the, to the background. And that just didn't, didn't seem right. At least right for me, obviously. Uh, and again, at the same time, the reading I'd been doing, the, the personal experiences I, I had had with respect to Christian faith made me think that the, the way to see what Christianity could be was historical. And obviously, the literary sources uh, have, have remained very important. I think I'm probably a more of an intellectual historian than social or, or, or historian from, from the bottom up, just because of the background of being convinced that written texts are, are really important. But try to see written and published texts against the background of, of the historical context in which they emerge just seemed increasingly good. So after I finished a master's degree at comparative, comparative literature at the University of Iowa, mostly I think to explore the realities of Christian faith. I, I enrolled at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, the master's program of what was then called church history. I think I would call it today the history of Christianity and found the study really, really illuminating, a lot of fun, intellectually stimulating, but also spiritually gratifying. And so again, finishing a master's degree there and then finding out you could actually, in my case, get part, part of your tuition as a graduate student paid for. And uh, keep studying these things just seemed the right step to take in those early days. And later, too, I think it's really important to mention that my wife, Maggie, was uh, willing to, to support me at, in various jobs she took while I was a, what my parents worried about being a perennial student. But uh, going on in the history of Christianity and then finding out that you could actually get a job teaching history was just a, a, a really great thing. So, yes. Literature, I don't think I've ever left behind, but I think literature writing in the in the context in which it was done has, has been what I've emphasized. It's very interesting. Thank you. Amongst all that you accomplished over the course of your service to the church and to the academy, during what season did you experience the greatest satisfaction? I'm grateful that you sent me that question ahead of time, Todd, because uh, I've looked back and, and my mind and heart and just filled with gratitude for the many different types when I felt real satisfaction. I'm I, thinking at, early on at a, when I was a very junior teacher at Trinity College in, in Deerfield and trying to teach courses in American history, introductory German, political science, a little mm-hmm. creative writing on the side. Uh, one year, George <laughs> Marsling came from Calvin College and was a visiting professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. I'd made in contact with David Wells, my primary teacher at Trinity Seminary, my years there. And for most of the year when George was in Deerfield, he and David allowed me to have coffee with them once a week. And that, I look back, is now a kind of marvelous post-doc experience of two yeah. senior very wise and, and accomplished Christian thinkers, different, different in many ways also, by no means sharing the exact same convictions or exact same way in which they went about their work, but, but certainly united. And I, I guess this would be probably a time to talk about a Christian academic vocation, united in thinking that they were doing what they were called to do by God, to do various kinds of historical and historical th- theological works. Certainly at uh, many years teaching at uh, Wheaton College, I, I certainly enjoyed the, the teaching, the opportunities to engage in my own scholarship, but always grateful for Wheaton as a teaching institution to make sure that faculty who felt called in that direction could have time and, and energy and 
a little bit of money at least to pursue their scholarship. So teaching and scholarship, we're very pleased to take part in a, a church here that is, is still our church home, what, almost 50 years, years later. And then in, in ways that looking back, not exactly sure how the, it came about, but it was also a great privilege to do things outside of normal academic duties, but with a, a whole range of Christian historians and historians who weren't necessarily believers, but interested in Christian topics through the Institute for the Study of American Evangelicals at Wheaton, the ISAE. It came into existence because of Wheaton was willing to have an institute. There was funding from the Lilly Endowment, eventually the Pew Charitable Trust. There was eventually wonderful leadership of the ISAE by Joel Carpenter, Edith Blumhofer, Mary Eskridge, Daryl Hart, and a cohort of not exactly again like-minded, but people looking at problems in the, in the, from the same direction. So my association with, with at this level really started Trinity College with, with the Dean Ed Hakes at a time when Trinity really didn't have any extra money. Somehow got a little bit of funding to do a conference and, and we could invite Nathan Hatch and George Marson to campus, Harry Stout, and think about in that, in that context, the, the, the Christian meaning of the American Revolution, and then at uh, Wheaton with the ISAE to have the privilege of doing conferences that very, very often some of the same people, Hatch, Marsden, Stout, Grant Wacker, Edith Blumhofer, uh, eventually friends from outside the United States, George Raleigh from Canada, uh, David Livingston from Northern Ireland, eventually Mark Hutchinson from Australia. Wow, wow. Carrying on with the um, normal academic activities at Wheaton and, and teaching and trying to work on my own research projects to have these extra things made for a kind of a stressful, over full life, but really in, in a term you used a very, very satisfying life as well. During those same years, I was privileged to be introduced to the people who ran the Reform Journal out of Grand Rapids, a lot of Calvin College people, a lot of hmm. William B. Erdman publishing people to start writing a little bit for the Reform Journal. And then I think I, when I was invited to be on the editorial committee, I might have been the first person not in the Christian Reform Church to, to do that. Really appreciated the support and bonhomie of Jan Pott, who was the editor of Erdman's and the editor of the Reform Journal. And then Wheaton Days and similar thing, real satisfaction working with John Wilson on, and, 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 uh, the people of Christianity Day and books and culture to have in both those cases, a reform journal and, and books and culture, the privilege of working on a publishing device that tried to occupy fruitfully that middle ground between academic writing and then popular writing and to do so in a Christian frame of reference. Not, not always apologetics, actually not very often apologetics, but trying it in a, in a kind of way that I guess I learned from Calvin College people and, and their debt to Abraham Kuyper, but other, other believers have learned it in other ways, to think that if, if you're a Christian and interested in the world, interested in the life of the mind, there really is nothing that falls outside the scope of those interests. So it, that was hugely satisfying. The privilege to then to teach at Notre Dame was hugely satisfied. Wasn't doing maybe quite as many things, but the things I was doing demanded more time to so keep going with scholarship and research on books that I'd been working on in many cases for, for decades, but then to have the privilege of being at a research university, which had obviously a different emphasis than a teaching college, to do so in a Catholic context mm -hmm. in the, in the post-Vatican II era when Protestants and Catholics were able to learn from each other, to have a remarkable group of PhD students who I would tell them you're teaching me as much as I'm teaching you. They would laugh and say, not believe it, but it was true. I'm afraid your, your question, which is simple and straightforward, got me thinking about how grateful I should be for, for a, an academic career that has involved real satisfaction in teaching, real satisfaction in my own research, real satisfaction in enterprises like the ISAE, like the Reform Journal, like books and culture that spiced up life wonderfully. 
and and then also to be in a position of, I don't know what, how I'd put it exactly, but feeling at home writing academically for other academics and feeling at home as a Christian writing for Christian audiences too. That's way too long of an answer, but uh, I want to record my debt to so many people who made these periods of satisfaction yeah. possible. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Thank you. No, my, my hope for all of us who take on this calling is that we uh, take time to appreciate those who've helped us along the way and that that assistance also brings that sort of abiding satisfaction that such a profession can offer. And so, yeah, thank you very much for offering that. How did you decide what projects to pursue? My guess is somewhere there over your shoulder uh, may still be folders with ideas uh, for projects. Um, some of which you may take up, some of which you may have decided to pass up. But how, do you, how did you decide over those seasons of your career which projects were to get attention and when? I think I was always able to have my own research interests as a kind of continuum or baseline. So starting out with a monographic, more detailed study of the College of New Jersey and the, and the Revolution era, for instance, in, in the time afterwards, and then thinking about larger questions of how theological commitments interact with American social and political life. Thinking about then that the Civil War is a time of theological involvement, a theological crisis. Then for really a project that started with one of the ISE meetings, 1979, uh, more than 40 years interest in the place that the Bible has had in, in American culture. So on one line, these are projects that interest me and I was committed to, but then for almost everything else, it was not so much choosing them, but people say, well, would, how would you like to do this? Or could, could you do such and such? I do remember the, the meeting where Nathan Hatch more or less coordinated discussion with someone from a funding agency. And in effect, this is making the story a little simpler than it actually was, but in, in effect said, well, Neil Planiga, you need to write about how theologians are, should do things better. David Wells, you need to write about how evangelical life in the United States needs strengthening. Mark, you need to write about why evangelical people don't do much academic life. And we sort of saluted and said, yes, sir. Neil Planiga did a wonderful <laughs> book on what became of sin. And David Wells did five or six really powerful books on a critique of the kind of way of life of evangelicals. And I did the scandal of the evangelical mind and kept going and tried to do something positive, Jesus Christ in the life of the mind. But none of that would have happened if Nathan hadn't. And it wasn't just him, George Mars and George Raleigh, Edith Bumhofer, eventually Grant Wacker. Yeah. They said, well, we should do this. And the ISE projects were all in their own way stimulating. Some, some of them, things I knew a little bit about, we did. Uh, Project on religion and American politics, project on Jonathan Edwards that I felt sort of in my areas of competence, but then projects on mission history where Dana Robert and Daniel Bays and Grant Wacker took the lead, uh, project on higher education where uh, the late Kenneth Ships and Joel Carpenter took the lead, projects on economics like in, in the United States where we were helped by the vice president for. Uh, the Money Matters at Wheaton College, D David Johnson, and a, a whole raft of other people. And, but these were projects I don't think I necessarily chose to do, but the ISA could make them happen. Science, and, and the Christian faith, and so you're able to get really positive leadership from David Livingston and, and Belfast. So th those were things that you sort of asked to do, writing for Reform Journal and Books and Culture. Sometimes there were things I, I wanted to do if I thought were interesting. Other times, the ideas that people came. So some combination of trying to have things I know I wanted to work on and, and things that others thought would be a good idea to work on is probably what, what characterized it when, I, when I've tried to do. Looking back, just, just because the things I've thought have been important, I've spent an awful lot of time on, have had pretty modest uh, <laughs> in the marketplace, yeah. where it's things that I often sometimes worked on in a real hurry and did because other people wanted them. 
like the scandal of the evangelical yeah. mind, do much better than I'd anticipated. My friends at Baker Books in Grand Rapids were willing at one time to entertain the idea. Well, I said, I, I've been writing poems occasionally off and on. How would you like to do a book of my poems? And you can imagine they scratched their head and, with a real burst of non enthusiasm, said, Well, wow. maybe, but <laughs> you, couldn't you give us a book that people might actually read? And uh, I said, Well, I had a few ideas from teaching the, the general history of Christianity. Yeah. And then through, through some experience that Wheaton College people set up for teaching, actually in Romania be, before the fall of the communist government. Well, how about the idea of a general history of Christianity based on turning points? Well, okay, that sounds good. Well, what I wanted to have Baker do is this book of poems that ended up selling probably a few hundred copies. But then the book Turning Points, now with the fourth edition and the wonderful help from David and Tom Line and Hanel, oh. Cancer Combine, has sold a lot of copies. So, and it, it took some work, but not nearly as much work as just figuring out what happened at Princeton, New Jersey from 1770 to 1790. But, and there's a few dozen people that are interested in that, but quite a few more maybe have benefited from a general history of Christianity. Thank you very much. Going back to one of the things that you mentioned early on in that, that thread there, that I'm going to guess that even in those early meetings, you could see that uh, one of your friends uh, would eventually, given the instructions that he was offering to his colleagues, would go on to serve as a provost and then eventually as a president of major universities. So that leadership uh, ability right. was beginning to emerge at that time even. Right. And I think the, the, the overarching thing, yeah. Jerry Ray, is, is how much in academic life, how much benefit came from people contributing their various skills to enterprises. Uh, certainly Nathan Hatch yeah. became a distinguished college administrator, but then so did Joel Carpenter, which, which was also in both cases, yep. I concluded a, a lot through detailed history work, but a tremendous gain for higher education, yep. Christian higher education, Christian thinking about uh, the life of the mind in the context of, of contemporary American society. So it was in miniature, I think, an example of how in the body of Christ, there are different gifts and different callings and when they're able to work together you have a, a really uh, positive situation. My, my, my hope, and it's getting a little bit ahead of us here, but my, my analysis of current academic and church institutional educational life today is that there really are a tremendous number of good things happening, but not as much cooperation in the body of Christ as, as would be good for whoever, academics, the general public, pastors, educators and and the like. Yeah, I would I would agree. If I may let's turn our attention to how you understand the Christian av academic vocation. Are there any commitments in your estimation that would define it maybe for you uh individually, but also perhaps, you know, for groups of scholars too that take on that calling? Yes. My own sense is reformed in a traditional way. Uh I mentioned being influenced some directly by Abraham Kuyper, more by people who were genuine Kuyperians, who were able to articulate a way in which the, the Christian faith, in fairly traditional evangelical terms, poses an antithesis between what the church does and what the world does. But also, the Christian faith teaches the general mercy and grace and uh, empowering of God for the world as a whole, which, which means that life in the world generally should be understood as an arena given by God that people with God-given abilities can take advantage of. So I thought actually for a long time, this would have come early on, that, that academic life for a Christian should emphasize depth and clarity and dedication to whatever the academic task is for its own sake. Meaning, because God mm. made it possible for humans to know the world, God made it possible for the world to exist, God made it possible for physicists, teachers of foreign language, 
sociologists, chemists, historians to understand yeah. something potentially truthful about the world that God made. And, and so that is a really dignified calling. At the same token, a, a Christian believer should see that the calling to study, and again, biology, sociology, foreign language, music, the calling to do that kind of study is a real gift of God for which praise can be offered to the creator and sustainer of the world. And again, with the image of the body of Christ, serious Christian commitment can coexist not as two parts of a sandwich, but as one integrated whole in enjoying the, the task. This would be for people outside of the academy as well, but enjoying the calling for itself and for Christian purposes. So my, my sense of the Christian academic vocation combines real seriousness about what people are studying a desire to learn from whoever else is studying them and a real serious commitment to the task as a gift of God that's able to support what comes from the church and his teaching, what comes from study of scripture and his teaching. So not either Christ or the academy, but, but the two of them together. A after the scandal of the evangelical mind was published, and the next day, in, in some ways, oh, to this day, I would hear from people who, who would say, I'm a such and such in the, in, the, in the university. When I'm at work at the university, I don't let, try not to let people know that I'm active in my local church. When I'm active in my local church, I have to be really careful about telling people that I'm a whatever, lawyer, a law teacher, economist, sociologist. What can I do? And my, my encouragement was only to say those parts of your life for, for good reason, for understandable reasons, might seem antagonistic. But for a believer, there just isn't any reason fundamentally why those parts of your life should be seem antagonistic. And then, thankfully, in most cases, I, I could point the inquirer, the person who made contact, to believers who were modeling what it meant to be serious in their fields and serious believers at the same time. And then I think over the decades, there's just more and more examples of that kind of positive synergy between serious academic commitment and serious faith commitment. Thank you. I want to ask you a little bit about experiences that can allow for the formation of such a sense of uh, commitment then and vocation. Um, you mentioned, you know, just a few seconds ago, uh, mentoring relationships, perhaps that, you know, you were able to introduce someone working in an academic field who didn't do so necessarily out of their faith context for various reasons, but you connected them with someone who did. You mentioned your uh, impromptu postdoc there uh, when you first started teaching uh, with David Wells and George Marsden. Are there experiences in your estimation that allow for the formation of these kinds of commitments in addition to maybe the ones that I just mentioned and that we've talked about? Yes, there are. And I think in almost every case, they have to do with positive personal encouragement that somehow factors into serious teaching, serious institutional involvement, serious scholarship. One of the things that makes me so grateful for the privilege of taking part in the ISAE is, is how much encouragement came when we had the funding and Wheaton's support and the capacity to work on a project. So I'm thinking, for example, of Edith Blumhofer's work over uh, many decades on Christian hymnody. Uh, I was able to assist Edith mm. in, in, in the proposal, I, I think, from the Little Endowment. We actually had funding to bring to Wheaton, I don't know, maybe 50 people who were doing serious mm. research, historical wow. things with, with him. Some of these folks I knew, many, many of them I hadn't. It just proved really satisfying for us as coordinators, but I think in many cases, even more satisfying for someone working that could have been in a Christian institution, could have been in, a, in a, a pluralistic institution, could have been as an independent scholar to come together and to say something like, well, 
you, you know, Isaac Watts was, was a stimulus for uh, an inspiration for Charles Wesley. And there's 10 people in the room who say, I know, I know. And then, then they could, they could, they could go on you know, very often in, in conferences like this. You, you had people who were not necessarily slogging away, but working away in a kind of an ordinary, semi isolated way and, and isolated because the academic world has just become so detailed. So nobody's a historian. No one's a historian of America. No one's a historian in the 18th century, but you're a historian of economic political connections in the second half of the 18th century and Detroit. That becomes your, your uh, specialty. But to have individuals who knew what you were studying, appreciated it, I, I think it was tremendously encouragement. I, I, I think of the way in which C.S. Lewis described one of the loves, I forget what it was, and, and, the, and the four loves. But you, you, you know, you have a real friendship that inspires and encourages when you look together, not at each other, but at the same thing. And you recognize that someone else, you too are interested in that. So that was, that was a great encouragement. I, I think that in particularly uh, the privilege of working with John Wilson at Books and Culture, John sought out younger people, sometimes advantageously situated, sometimes all by themselves. It would give them assignments to write essays on, on books or in some cases movies, which I wasn't all that keen on, but he, he showed how you could have really interesting essays on movies and very often be done by people, younger people who needed that kind of, kind of encouragement. And then the, the process of supervising many MA theses I did at Wheaton and then fewer, but still a significant number of PhD dissertations at Notre Dame. You could see with at least many people that an older person's interest in what they had found to be important, but perhaps no one else seemed to be important, just could be uh, a, a great help. And so I was nervous at Wheaton, but even more nervous at Notre Dame about the employability of people who did history master's degrees and PhD, history PhDs. That was always a kind of a dark cloud in the horizon. But the process of uh, working fruitfully with people, telling them, you know, you're really teaching me things and meaning it could be really encouraging. So somehow a personal contact, which I think at many of the Christian colleges now, administrators realize that it can be a real help. So seminars of, of different kind, opportunities that are provided for faculty to get together on more than just the nuts and bolts of running the institution, but actually having substantive discussions on their fields, the way their fields interact, the way their interaction in the fields relates to the Christian faith. These are all, I think, experiences that breathe life in the Christian academic vocations. Are there temptations in today's academy that often hinder the formation of those commitments? I mean, one of them you've talked about is the increasing rate of specialization to carve out a niche um, so that it may be hard then for someone to find someone with whom to talk. Are there temptations that you would point to and say that even if they come for some good reasons, we may need to be wary about them and address them? Temptation for Christian academics are mostly the kind of temptations that all believers face. You, the temptation to think that you're more important than other people, the temptation to be happy when somebody who's doing something, the same thing has a problem, uh, the temptation to be so busy that you don't have time to listen. These are not academic temptations exclusively. But yes, I think the, a modern academic life has the virtues of specialization. But then as you indicate, the virtues can become a vice. If, if you really are dedicated and have done good work on a very narrow topic, and there's just no one around that knows anything about what you're doing, that can be uh, extremely uh, disillusioning. I do think, and this is beating a drum that many others have, be have been beating that the last 15 and 20 years have seen a politicization of many academic things that have just been uh, really terrible. Because in the academic ideal, we know that growth comes from patient listening to people with whom we disagree, and then low caloric discussion back and forth. Yeah. So as soon as shouting starts, 
or as, as soon as labeling takes the place of careful discrimination, we have a problem. And we're speaking now in early 2024, and we've, we've seen over the last months, the university presidents resign for, for not saying the right things in the right way about the Israel-Hamas struggle. We, we've seen political positions hurting people, holding jobs, getting jobs. And it's never, not, and of course, it's not the case that partisanship and politics were absent in the history of American higher education, but I think there's a special danger now. And I, I actually think for some Christian scholars, there's a real temptation just to be too busy. And here I'm probably in a confessional mode here now because the great thing is the great thing in, in so many of our Christian institutions is to have multiple valuable things to do. Really work hard at your teaching. Mm -hmm. Really work hard at your mentoring. Really work hard at your scholarship. Really do the right thing in your local church. Always keep in mind your family if you have a family, uh, your kids at different stages of their lives. And you begin to add up maybe a 80 or 90 hours of responsibility when you have 40 or 50 or 60 hours to get things done. And somehow, I think this is hard, particularly for evangelical people. And I'm using the term in its, its older religious sense. It's hard for evangelical people to say no and not feel guilty that they're, they're yeah. somehow missing out doing things that the Lord wants them to do. But I, I came to the conviction and took a long time and my wife might say I'm still not there yet, but being able to say no with a clear conscience, I think is a really important Christian virtue that uh, at least some very busy people should cultivate. Yeah, I think that's very important advice. When you mentioned that you were about to go into confessional mode along these lines, I thought the confessional is crowded um, nice. <laughs> there. You're not alone in that space. Right. I think that, um, yeah, that, that plagues a number of our colleagues. Okay. Uh, in terms of how they, they orient themselves. You mentioned the vices and then virtues. Uh, I want to ask in particular if there are virtues, whether they be intellectual, moral, and or theological, that prove, in your estimation, most critical to the exercise of the Christian academic vocation. And maybe there are seasons in which some virtues are more critical, given the debates or the discussions or the projects. Right. I, I do think that what the things I've mentioned before, that always realizing that academic work, like church work, like social involvement is a personal as well as an intellectual matter. And keeping other people in mind when you're dedicated to your own task, always treating others as helpers instead of just servants. I think it was Nathan Hatch or maybe some other administrator with a whole lot of experience once told me, I, I can tell a lot about a potential hire, but how the person treats the departmental secretaries, the departmental staff. And that resonated with me because I, I was, I've been aware for a very long time. I mean, back to the first teaching positions at Trinity College when there wasn't hardly any money and, and people were very stressed that you just couldn't do your work as an academic without the support staff and, and to, not to realize that you're the fundraisers and the secretaries and the student assistants were people too. It's just, just wrong. Another virtue I think uh, alluded to already is, is the confidence that academic work, like all other legitimate callings, can be a God-honoring enterprise. And it, it's, it's not as though academic work should be done as an instrumental end to evangelization, although it's always good when there's an evangelistic uh, outcome. It's, it's not, it shouldn't be a, uh, a way to uh, simply earn money or have a position, but it's a calling and, and uh, realizing that your work can be a calling, I think is a, is a Christian virtue. And then certainly uh, academics maybe are more prone to the, the vice of thinking of themselves more highly high than they ought to think. But uh, the virtue certainly is that when you do accomplish something that is valuable and others see the valuable, you realize how many others have contributed, how in the broader scope of things, the eternal scope of things, things we do have only a, a modest, very modest importance. And having the kind of humility that doesn't say, I'm humble, look how proud I am of my humility, but having, having a humble approach to what we do in academic life as well as 
all other spheres of life is a really positive virtue as well. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to need to set aside the work I was doing this morning on that essay, uh, touting my humility then, and uh, get on with other projects <laughs> in that regard. I want to ask now, if I could, at what level, in terms of the cultivation of these virtues, are individual scholars responsible, as well as then are the institutions where they serve responsible? You know, where where does that fall in terms of, you know, what we should take on on our own versus uh, how we should create institutional cultures and that offer practices that cultivate these virtues. That certainly is an awfully pressing, pertinent question. Maybe a, a little bit more germane for college administrators, fundraisers, but but important for everybody. Fruitful and God honoring academic life, I think, begins with personal commitment. But personal commitment always in, in the context of needing help. Uh, I do think administrators today are really stressed at meeting budgets, uh, particularly administrators who realize how important the humanities are, how important it is to have undergraduates and graduate students learn abilities and not just money-making capacities. And I think it is also always helpful for people in the trenches and the academics to understand what kind of institution you are. It really was a real privilege for me to teach at Trinity College and, and Wheaton and Notre Dame, three, many ways, quite different institutions. Uh, but to realize that each one had its own integrity, each one had a set of goals that were preeminent, other goals that were secondary, and to realize that where you are should at least influence to some degree how you Think of yourselves as contributing to the to the institution. So at Wheaton, again, I think as I mentioned, I was I was really pleased that, that, that an institution primarily to be teaching at undergraduates had a space for scholarship. At Notre Dame, I was always encouraged that although the bar for scholarship was raised very high, it was clearly communicated to the departments that nobody who couldn't hold their own in the classroom was going to be there for very long and, 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 and promoted. So to, to see where you were and what kind of institution, some institutions have funding for academic cooperation. Some simply don't. Trying to make the best of what you have with what you have is good advice for everyone, but, but hard, hard, to, hard to take, hard to, hard to, advice is hard to follow. A question I want to ask then now is, what is your assessment of the present health of the academic vocation, and in particular, the Christian academic vocation. I do think that in many scholarly fields, the Christian involvement is very strong. So I'm thinking, for example, of legal scholars and, and John Witte at Emory, mm. David Skeel, University of Pennsylvania, others at, at different institutions, the, the program that John Witte has organized on Christianity and the law which didn't exist 40 years ago. I think of the programs that the Veritas Forum runs with a whole roster of important, serious scholars doing really good work. The institutions that now exist at many colleges and universities where there's a, a Christian study center, many places mm -hmm. like the Washington University in St. Louis that has an active and, and quite visible Christian faculty fellowship I think of the, the positive contribution that today, in a way that was not the case 50 years ago, Catholic and Protestant scholars benefit from each other's work. So in many ways, I think the academic life for Christian terms is, is very strong. A difficulty, it seems to me, and it's, it's a serious difficulty, is that this sphere of Christian academic involvement often seems quite disconnected from the larger currents that are that receive a lot of media attention that, that fill up the social media ether. And that that is a is a problem. But but the the positive mm -hmm. is just a lot of really strong work in, in many academic fields. Uh, and through theology and biblical studies as well. So a, a mixed bag. Good good in, in what is being done. Not so helpful, not so, uh, not what it could be in, in um, a broader 
place in the contemporary culture. What would you view as the greatest possibilities or opportunities for enhancing the health of the Christian academic vocation? Combinations probably of, of commitment, mentorship, learning, administrative, wisdom, money, obviously important. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I feel privileged to have benefited from different kinds of positive administrative support at all the places I, I've taught. They have been very different in, in their own ways, but also quite fortunate never to have had really serious administrative responsibilities myself. So I, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to speak about what they should do when I've been the beneficiary of so much good yeah. support in, in so many different ways. I've, I've often said that actually, if you have two faculty members together exercising their opinions about administrative efforts, you've got at least four opinions there. So uh, I think our administrators and friends who are listening will greatly appreciate that, that restraint then <laughs> in terms of what they may face on their own campuses. In what ways did that sense of the Christian academic voca vocation change, if at all, over the course of your career? That's a really interesting question. The answer to probably depends on what part of the Christian world, what part of the academic world you were in. Certainly, when I was an undergraduate at Wheaton, we had some terrific teachers and people who were really, really expert in what they knew. But the sense that publishing for your academic peers might be a really positive thing for Christian scholars to do. It was not uppermost. It was some, some that happened. Now, I have a privilege not too long ago to just do a glance through the records of Wheaton faculty. And again, the institution has not changed its, 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 its major goals of being a strong undergraduate institution, but a really solid percentage now are, are publishing for their peers. And often, importantly, not always, and certainly doesn't have to be always, but often with work showing the Christian implications or, or effects of, of their particular scholarly domains. So that, that to me, is, is an improvement. I do think that the pressure on particularly undergraduates, but also graduate students to have employable skills for the first job has become ever stronger. It's entirely understandable, particularly given the economic situations to which we've gone through, but needs to be held in check by the academic purpose, undergraduate especially, but also graduate, to prepare people for a life of thinking, commitment, engagement, discussion, contribution as thinkers, Christians, and citizens, as well as just economic machines. And I suppose we should mention social media too, but uh, uh, since I don't do too much social media, I'm not by no means an expert, but <laughs> from, from every, everything that you hear and, and see, the last 20, 25 years of accessibility to a social media sphere has certainly complicated academic life. As you look back over that, that time period of your career, are there efforts, seasons in which you think the Christian academic vocation came closer or closest to fulfilling uh, its promise? Um, there are notable examples that maybe you would want to mention. Yes. Probably my view of history is such that the good times are always going to be attended by the bad times. The bad times always have some good, good to them. But, but yeah, clearly, course. watching the, the recognition that George Marsden's career gained with publication in 2004, 2005, it's a major biography of Jonathan Edwards, given the Graymeyer Prize for significant work in religion, and then the, the prize given in American history to, to the most significant book of the year. I think it was a memorable moment because it showed a faithful Christian scholar not doing his work for academic purposes, nonetheless did the work of such quality that could be recognized, as it were, in-house among believers, but also in the academy as a whole. I certainly am encouraged with my own interest in the world history of Christianity with the recognition that Dana Robert Boston University has, has gained as a prolific guide of doctoral students, but also for her own research on the importance of new dimensions of Christianity around the world. In the same category would be the work that Joel Carpenter has done after leaving, after being provost at Calvin in, in many different dimensions of helping non-Western Christian academics have access to some of the resources that 
we we in the West uh, have found so so valuable. Um, I mentioned the, the the legal Christian enterprises, and, and uh, I'm just standing in awe at the work of someone like John Whitty and and, uh, and many many associates in bringing first order religious questions into the perception of of, of legal scholars. And there there are there I think many others that, that uh, one could note. But always alongside of, to be realistic, always alongside of problems that continue and downturns that take place as well as significant achievements. Thank you. For young persons who are exploring a calling to the Christian academic vocation, what questions would you encourage them to pursue? Especially in a day where there's so many pressures on academic life, including academic appointments, at least in the humanities and some, uh, some other fields. Uh, just having the wisdom of serpents and the innocence of doves is, is awfully important. I, I know I think the jobs were not readily available when I was finishing graduate school, but it just didn't seem to be the pressure to, that you had to strategize and had to think ahead. Certainly it became customary at Notre Dame for all people who had PhD students to just tell people right from the start, your training will make you a better thinker, a better researcher, a better writer. It may not despite what you do, it may not yield a position in, in academic life as has been, has been customary. So realism. But, but I think for particularly young Christian scholars, sensing that the life in the academy can be a, vo- a vocation in Christian term, the calling means that people should give it everything they have while keeping their eyes open for what they may need to do to earn a living, but not, not to be nervous about any weakness in the, in the vocational choice, choice itself. So that confidence, along with trying to find personal connections that are encouraging, remains very important. Are there particular opportunities that you would encourage them to pursue or explore? Younger scholars who have the chance to take part in programs like Valparaiso University. Valparaiso University has undertaken for many years, and it's, it's uh, fellowships for younger scholars are t- terrific. I know there are some colleges and universities themselves that have special classes for incoming faculty. I think probably the, the, the general advice would be, yes, keep going or what is your specialty. Don't let that energy flag, but try as much as possible to see what are other opportunities available. And in the negotiating process of keeping at what you're called to do primarily and enabling yourselves of taking advantage of other things. Just try to seek a balance. Balance is such a good ideal and such a difficult ideal to reach, but balance for younger people, mid-career people, older people, retired people, I think is always a, a positive goal. What mistakes then would perhaps you encourage them to try to avoid making? Narrow focus on one thing, not being willing to say no if you're already doing too many things and asked to do do another thing, ignoring the character of your own institution and what can be possible. There's there's no point in longing to be somewhere else if you're missing the opportunities to help out where, where you are. And, and then simply, I think, avoiding the mistake of being inert to an in, environment and, and somehow thinking that the problems you have are unique or the problems you have are unsolvable. And then I would, I would think a, a mistake to avoid, a really important mistake to avoid would be working so hard at your academic life that your, your, your family suffers, your church involvement is, is under, under, undercut. Christian academic life needs, I think, to be very strong in commitments to academics, but needs also to be continually Christian as well. Thank you want to turn our attention in our last uh, segment here together to the relationship that church-related higher education shares with the church. And I want to start by asking you, in what ways is the health of church-related higher education dependent upon the health of the church? Yes, I think a great deal of synergy is involved. Uh, There won't be solid Christian colleges and universities if they're not students who have been prepared for such work by their local churches. And I don't, I don't think there'll be strong local churches if they ignore what academic Christians have to offer them. 
It's not as though the churches should be run by academics. It's not as though the colleges should think of themselves entirely as churches. But clearly in the body of Christ, there are different callings. And in an ideal Christian world, the different callings realize the support they need from the other. I do think in the contemporary American situation, when church life is dominated by uh, partisanship, partisan political commitments, then church life suffers in general. And, and that suffering is communicated to the Christian colleges and universities as well. But again, I, ideally, there should be support back and forth. And that, that I think, is probably one of the great challenges in the present and the immediate future to see more sense of cooperation, compatibility from the church sphere of the churches and the sphere of the educational institutions. In what ways then, from your perspective as a historian, uh, but over the course of your career, has the relationship between the church and church-related higher education changed, if at all? I'm not sure I, I'm confident to speak of that just because way, way back in my adult life, my wife and I decided that I, I would not take invitations, Sunday invitations to go talk at other churches. So I, I know what our church has been like yeah. and, and not as much about the ecclesiastical landscape even close to hand. But I, I think in our experience, I've, I've been really grateful for pastors, associate pastors, administrators in the church who have welcomed teachers at, from, from Wheaton, the College of DuPage, the University of Notre Dame, but not tried to orient their own ministry to them. So I, I think we've just been privileged to have pastors who are wonderful people and serious in their commitment to the scriptures and not ignoring or, or putting down the, the teachers in the crowd, but realizing that the church is for everybody. And, and somehow a positive church academy relationship is going to take for granted the strengths that each bring to the other, but not focus on them because the purpose of academic life is not the same as the purpose of church life. And the purpose of church life is not the same as a academic life. So again, cooperation, balance, mutuality, these I think are the, the key matters. As we prepare to close our conversation together, what advice would you offer Christian scholars concerning how they can be of greater service to both the church, but then also the academy? I think I would say self-consciousness about the tremendous privilege it is to have employment, trying to train younger people, employment that allows for some time for research, some time for writing, an attitude of gratitude for possibilities probably is a good place to start than whatever structural goals or programs you, you have in mind. And those will be tremendously different. But just thankfulness for having in, in the modern world and, and having in the American educational universe opportunities to be an academic and to do so as a believer. Are there um, any commitments that you would encourage them to consider or commitments that you would caution them you know, about? I mean, one of the things that you talked about was you and your own wife had to decide that Sunday morning commitments, despite you know, the intense sense of calling that the two of you had for the church, but Sunday morning commitments uh, and requests were not going to be ones that you were going to accept. Are there things along those lines that you would encourage younger scholars to think about where they can contribute but where they also need to be cautious, too, in terms of maintaining a sense of balance in relation to other opportunities. Well, I certainly found, and this is not going to be true for everyone, that, that being a fairly strict Sabbatarian, I mean, taking walks on Sunday and watching mm -hmm. a football game on Sunday and trying to connect with relatives on Sunday and, and just not doing academic work and not even, gosh, checking email on Sunday. Of course, we didn't have email back the day when we started this, but it was a real good commitment. Because <laughs> it meant then that um, hard work and a lot of work during the six-day week would be balanced by a day in which reflection on, on the, the, the gift of time, the gift of family, the gift of church, the gift of rest, 
uh, could be important. Commitments not to uh, avoid, I, I, I think, will, will really be different for, for diff- different people and, and, and will depend a lot on the kind of academic establishment. But certainly being overcommitted to just one thing, whether that be the classroom or your own research or trying to help out run the institution from committees, just again, balance will be a key and, and avoiding the imbalance of emphasizing any one thing at the expense of others. That's wise advice and on which we can close our time then together today. Thank you very much. Our guest has been Mark A. Knoll, the Francis A. McEnany Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Notre Dame. Thank you for taking the time to share your insights and your wisdom with us. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you, Ty. Thank you for joining us for Saturdays at 7. Christian Scholars Review's conversation series with thought leaders about the academic vocation and the relationship that vocation shares with the church. We invite you to join us again next week for Saturdays at 7.